Good afternoon everyone and today from MGM we are bringing a World Lung Day special. The, the burning uh, issue which has come out of this whole pandemic is that we've been neglecting and abandoning our lungs very very badly and with me I have three big doyens uh, in the field of pulmonology. Uh, we have Dr. P.K. Thomas sir, sir good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Jay Raman and yeah. Dr. Somitra Roy and I am really really yeah. happy to be sitting here with all three of them. So let me start with a very very general question as to what exactly do we mean by World Lung Day? Roy. Okay well uh, World Lung Day is here we are now focusing to the lung health which is extremely important now in the background of this severe COVID other viral diseases, tuberculosis, which is one of the greatest killer of uh, India presently of respiratory infections. So with all this background and the COPD, which with the environmental pollution, the outdoor environmental pollution and also and very importantly, the indoor environmental pollution is a commonest cause of is the commonest cause of the females who are coming out with COPD. So all these things are making a huge impact on the respiratory health. If you take some numbers, ma'am, uh, say a COPD India, a common, the fourth commonest cause of death in India is COPD. Uh, respiratory disease all together, everything together is the second commonest cause of death in India. Obviously, the cardiovascular heart and uh, brain uh, diseases comes in the first cardiovascular accident comes in the first. Then if you are talking of the cancers, cancers is uh, about fourth commonest cause of death in India. Out of that lung cancer is the again fourth commonest cause of, of that. The first three are breast, cervical diseases and the oral, oral cancers, cancers in the male. So all <coughs> these are actually coming down, boiling down to respiratory disease though uh, the health policy makers till before the COVID has hardly put any effort. You see cardiovascular causes, heart and I, I brain was going to ask about that. I mean that's that's something which is very very interesting. I'm going to ask sir that. Sir, PK sir, uh, right from the time when we have been doing MBBS and all, I think this the <coughs> chapters of asthma, chronic bronchitis, emphysema has always been like one rushed affair always you know the 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 lungs okay you know they will uh, they will take this three topics in one 45 minute session and the copd and the chronic lung diseases are done with it you know and like you have to read it's going to come as a short note and that's what what is your take on has anything changed in the last 30 years of our teaching have we evolved yeah. in these diseases yeah um, short answer is that we have evolved but whether we have really evolved or not, I think we need to understand. We need to understand two organs which are lying side by side without question, which are of uh, equal importance. One is a loved up which will stop in one minute. Absolutely. And after that, life will end. And the other is a lung which has got a huge yes. reserve. It's got a huge reserve because the lung has got a huge reserve. Is why people underestimate lung diseases because you'll huff and puff and wheeze and whine, but you won't die. You see, the mortality is so prolonged in lung disease that people obviously are unaware of the, of, the, of the fact that this can prolong into a problem. They don't know. They always think an asthmatic attack is a one-off. They come back to you again and then they learn over a period of time that it's a problem. And I think the same case occurs with COPD itself. The smoker is a sort of uh, jolly go fellow who keeps smoking and smoking and smoking and finally lands up with something. In spite of know, knowing that every single pack of cigarettes that he has, has a warning written on top of that. He's obviously read it a thousand times. As, as Mark Twain said, I've done it a thousand times and it, it's pretty easy. There's easy. no question about it. So I think it has evolved, but I think it's the problem of people not understanding the organ as such. That is, I think, the problem. Our problem is to say that the lung has huge problems and we can deal with lung problems. A lot of lung problems, if you detect early, are almost 100% treatable. And I think that's the message that we need to drive home today. 
that the lung is not a bad organ the lung is a good organ i'm not saying the heart is a bad organ the cardiologist will come after me i won't do that but i will say that the lung is an organ where diseases can be identified early and treated early and people can be extremely comfortable yeah absolutely i think the most important thing here which people don't understand that that beautiful red organ in the middle of our chest is being supported by those two beautiful wings which is giving it the oxygen and we cannot afford to forget the lung at all you know the can i say one more thing now there used to be a joke about uh, the pulmonologist and the cardiologist the cardiologist will have a suit on the fifth floor the pulmonologist will be at the basement <laughs> um that's that's the way i think we have i'm not saying that we have been treated but that's the way people perceive these two diseases the <coughs> whole concept of looking at your lungs itself is something which is new and covid has given us a huge kick, kick without question absolutely there no no question about it. covid at least has reminded people that they have two lungs not one so that is very important so we need to understand that we need to utilize this and increase lung awareness and i think once you increase lung awareness you will increase every other thing related to the lung yeah yeah i think that's really really well put and the 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 most important part of the treatment of these the triad of chronic lung diseases the asthma uh, chronic bronchitis and which kind of ends up with emphysema is the lack of awareness the lack of uh, what to say the 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 huge factor the patients have is that i don't want to become dependent on these medicine when they don't realize the dependency part of it jeremen sir i mean inhaler phobia i think that's your passion sir inhaler phobia what do you what do you have to say about that yeah regarding the you know awareness this purpose of this world lung day is to create awareness this is a annual even world lung day so lot of diseases of lung disease are preventable treatable manageable and curable disease curable disease as of now the standard of care for airway disease like asthma and covpd or inhaler treatment inhaler treatment directly the medicine will go into the lung and act immediately to control the inflammation and relieve the symptoms that is the most important thing here and what we are using is the inhaler medications are all uh, microgram dose the side effect point of view very very negligible when you compare to the oral tablet or injections if you take uh, it will take very long time to act so if you swallow the tablet it will take it go into the stomach and it will take a minimum 3 4 hours to act but inhalation medicine directly reaches the site of the you know disease it act immediately so inhalers are one of the vara prasad in uh, latest you know edition one of the gold standard treatment for the airway disease management so that's why the uh, world lung day we are creating awareness for this type of uh, chronic lung disease which requires a uh, lot of you no know, treatment modalities are coming previously we used a uh, four times per day inhaler now we are using single puff once daily preparation is available so this is the advanced advancement in the airway disease management not only that so creating awareness of this there are a world you no know, uh, world health organization is creating a lot of theme of this uh, world lung day all first theme is say no to tobacco because you know tobacco causes all the diseases head to foot but primarily the lung disease covpd lung cancer infection aggravation asthma attack all very very important second theme is vaccination one of the important preventable lung diseases pneumonia now covid we are struggling covid also preventable disease if you take a vaccine and do all appropriate covid appropriate behavior completely we can prevent the covid infection likewise we have influenza annual influenza vaccination is there and pneumococcal pneumonia more than 25 years we are practicing but creating awareness is very very important and air pollution air pollution plays a major role in uh, disease not only respiratory cardiovascular cerebrovascular all the events and finally pulmonary rehabilitation for the chronic lung disease as well as we have a exercise program normal individual do exercise regularly this is one of the main theme of the world lung day this is a very important update thank you thank you very much sir that was really very very uh, like in details about how the who is going about and how much of it is we are implementing i think the amount of uh, construction sites which are increasing in any metro the type of construction which is happening on the roads the number of vehicles which is increasing in the cities i think delhi is our capital is one of the uh, best or the worst example of pollution come october it starts there is no breathing air there at all am i not right yeah. roy right yeah. so mitra i mean people 
cannot breathe there they don't they, i think they they will probably people will start having respirators at home pretty soon yeah. so what do you have to say about that again data let's yes. talk about data data yeah uh, 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 just very very recently some few days ago who has changed or it has become more stringent to what is a good air air pollution or air pollutant level should be so if you talk about that that their last revision was 2005 mm. and from 2005 now they revised because it has been found from many researches that the those uh, important air pollutants are not only causing lung diseases but they are causing havoc to the whole body the specifically we are talking of a particulate matter there are two types of particulate matter 10 mic uh, 10 size and 10 micron size and 2.5 micron size this 2.5 micron is the most important here because that not only goes inside the lung yeah. but it it will go inside the blood vessels and it can go to the whole body so let's talk about the 2.5 micron size current status chennai if you just see the net you can see it's somewhere around 57 the current average chennai uh, 2.5 particulate matter uh, status what is the who goal who goal is 10 is the ideal so we are about six times more than the who current goal uh, if you talk about delhi extremely pollutant somewhere around 100 ppm is that uh, area in delhi all other big cities are in trouble mm -hmm. but perhaps we are slightly better because chennai is having slightly lower population density than perhaps the other big cities of the india uh, country so th there we have got some kind of a respite i think we also have this huge coastal line and the density pollution density uh, the population density starts kind of going lesser towards the yeah. coastal line <coughs> and uh, we are uh, 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 actually ma'am mm. some time ago i actually have done a study with uh, police people of chennai city mm. uh, we just wanted to see how much is the population air pollution is uh, getting affected to those police uh, traffic police people who are having daily duties on the road okay so in that we found that ki even if they are not smokers they are taking somewhere around six cigarettes uh, size Sp of wow. uh, uh, smokes in their lungs daily uh, in a month uh, even if they are non-smokers so basically all we are in chennai who are non-smoker are taking six cigarettes per day per day whatever cigarette numbers you are smoking as a person is above that six or seven imagine wow that's that's just mind-boggling i mean <coughs> we don't even think about how many cigarette a non-smoker does as a passive smoker right and we are adding the pollution the pollutant the indoor pollution which so which you also mentioned before to it and i think we are heading towards i mean forget the greenhouse effect at the atmosphere level we are destroying it at our breathing level right now mm. one of the worst reason or one of the reasons why we get affected by multiple viral infections during the rainy season is the increased density the molecule density and uh, the humidity and what do we have to say about that jeraman sir i mean the infection part of it where we have this double whammy of uh, H1N1, we have diabetic patients and then they end up with uh, bacterial infections also. I mean, we, how does that work? How does that happen? Yeah, usually this type of the climatic variation, the monsoon changes usually start in our places, uh, southwest and northeast monsoon. From uh, no, June, July, August, we usually we call it as uh, southwest monsoon and the October, November, December, we call it as the northeast monsoon. These monsoon, the climate uh, no, conditions, no, a lot of uh, infections, mainly the viral infections, 
viral infection. This is a good climatic nature. The virus replicate and the mutation viruses, everything. That's why the you know uh, winter season every year we recommend to take the annual flu vaccination to prevent swine flu. So this is important because of these climatic changes, uh, the rain season, monsoon changes, it will create a lot of infection, particularly the viral infections. For the respiratory point of view, the influenza A virus is a very common uh, though in our place. So that's why the WHO and the ICMR are recommending to take the vaccinations of all the you know adult 50 plus group and the less than 50 those who are having chronic ailments like you know diabetes and chronic conditions, we recommend to take the annual flu shot to prevent the influence of vaccination. Not only that, other uh, pneumonias, community of pneumonias are very common. These type of infections will aggravate already existing disease, patients suffering from asthma, COPD, ILD, or TB, old PT, there is a pulmonary tuberculosis patient, now we call it as a tuberculosis associated pulmonary obstructive lung disease. So these patients, once they get an infection, they will aggravate, they lead to the acute and chronic lung disease which requires the hospitalization. Now the terminology is a lung attack, we call it as any acute and chronic lung disease which, that, uh, which requires the hospitalization that to ICU for the oxygen and other supporting measures. Now we call it as the uh, lung attack. Because of the uh, every you know climatic variations, because of infection plays a major role. So the lung conditions mainly the lung diseases mainly due to the infection and allergens. Allergens means pollution, in, uh, internal and external pollutions, causing major impact on the respiratory health. So the flu vaccination, not only flu, all the adult vaccinations are very very important protective strategy we have to follow. That's why the uh, you no know, WHO recommending through the you know World Lung Day, the second important theme is protect them through vaccinations, adult vaccination. Because in our country, pediatric vaccinations are 100% accurate. But in adult vaccination, there is uh, zero. There is no idea about vaccination. Now slowly it's coming up. Because of this type of uh, no, awareness program, so people are uh, no, recognizing, yes, there is adult vaccination is there. We have to take it. So this way, we update the program. That's why this uh, World Lung Day Awareness Program. So the vaccination part of it is like this, I think. The up to the age of 10, the vaccination is 100%. After 10, the five year booster dose, even there, unless its mm -hmm. parents are aware of it, nobody comes. We become, as a, as a physician, I get involved when I have these university students who come in for stamping for their, uh, uh, for the pre-university uh, check and all that. Then we realize, okay, we need to rubella and all those things and all. Adult vaccination as such has become a huge discussion point now when the COVID vaccinations have become a prime thing. I have to reiterate here, I'm going to take advantage of World Lung Day to make a point here, saying that those who have appropriately vaccinated themselves, even though we are at the brink of the third wave, plus minus, I don't know, but those people who are getting infected are definitely low intensity and they even if the lungs are more involved, not damaged yet, but more involved, their infection and their intensity of the infection is much, much less. We may be reporting more cases in the future, but those who are vaccinated are still very, very safe. So the underlined uh, statement about vaccination goes a long, long way. But let's come back to World Lung Day and the, the uh, evaluation of diseases, the assessment of lung, the lung function test is still a very huge uh, interpretive value on how to um, uh, interpret those values on the lung function test and I am not very good with that also. I leave it to the experts. I only know two things. Okay, what is the tidal volume and what is the, uh, the FEV11? That's it. Okay, fine. I leave it at that and I see the last sentence. Okay, what is the pulmonologist written? So, sir, I want you to tell me about how, what are the newer advances in lung function test technique and how do we interpret those? How do we differentiate between asthma and chronic bronchitis? No, I think, um, thank you. Um, uh, the word chronic bronchitis itself is off the calendar right now. So we call it asthma or you call it COPD. That's all, chronic obstructive lung disease. Asthma has two facets. One facet is a genetic facet which you have. The second is an environmental facet. You put these two things together in the right perspective, you get asthma. COPD, on the other hand, 
is subject to all sorts of occupational irritants and pollutants that you have. Smoking is a huge cause of COPD without question. But then today in India, we have what is called non-smoking COPD. With all this fossil fuel consumption in kitchens and cooking and all those, that's why we have a huge burden of female COPD who are non-smokers. And these are fossil fuel COPD. So this is one basic difference between these two entities. Number two, Asthma is reversible. Asthma is reversible in the sense that you give a medication, your asthma reverses completely. And that's a diagnostic test to say you have asthma. You have a little wheezing, you have airflow limitation, you give a drug which is a bronchodilator, you give it by, by inhalation and then you remeasure this, you find that the, um, uh, that the flow is reversed. Whereas in COPD, there is a very low reversal, there is very low reversal or no reversal at all. And that's the real problem between asthma and COPD. The third thing is age. Generally, asthma is associated with the younger age group. COPD is associated with the older age group. Now, this is sort of becoming difficult territory today between asthma and COPD. We have a lot of later onset asthmatics who start symptoms at 35, 40, 50 years. We honestly don't know what to call them. We say it's, it is some sort of late onset asthma. There are various types of uh, asthma depending upon the cellular components that we have. But the fact does remain that these are the two basic entities and I think you need to realize that smoking is a preventable cause of smoking cessation is a preventable cause of COPD without question. I think that's something that all of us should understand. Everybody who works in an occupation which is causing COPD like you work in the coal or gold fields or, or you, you work in mines or you work in factories where there are a lot of um, um, uh, industrial pollution. I think the awareness should be there. There are already, I think, strict environmental rules where you need to do a spirometry and a pulmonary function test. Coming to the test, the spirometry or a simple pulmonary function test is the best. For a screening situation, you don't really know you need to go into huge detail. There are just three values that you need to look at. You need to look at FVC, you need to look at F FEV1, which is the force expiratory vo volume in one second, and then you need to look at the percentage. The simpler you make the spirometry, the easier it is so that everybody understands that. Even a patient should understand his FEV1 by FVC, what is his percentage. And I think that is important. So that's one simple screening spirometry, which is very important. More complicated stuff like the DLCO, for example, the um, fraction of uh, carbon, uh, carbon monoxide, is a more closer index of oxygen exchange. You can use that if you want. There are other parameters like impulse oscillometry, for that matter, which will look at what we call the small airways, which are the deeper airways as such. But then those are all... Um, uh, things that are coming up more for research and not for daily practice. So in daily practice today, you use two entities, which are these two things that I talked to you about, spirometry and the DLCO. There is one more dynamic index of lung function, which is called the six-minute walk distance, and that is being practiced in situations like COPD, where you measure a pulse oximetry and you ask him to walk for six minutes and you relook at the, at the spirometry, at the um, pulse oximetry again. This is called exercise desaturation. How much of desaturation do you, uh, do you have after six minutes of steady walking, straight walking, what, uh, what do you have? These are called dynamic tests. Like the six minute walk distance, you have a lot of other tests like a shuttle walk test. You have a bicycle ergometry, you have all sorts of things. But the six minute walk test is a test that you can do at home. You just need to walk for six minutes. Whether you go up and down a room or you walk down a straight corridor, if you do have a corridor, and that's what it is. So lung function is measurable in very simple terms, simplistic terms at home. Like, for example, in COVID, we tell them, you put on your um, oximeter, go to the washroom and come back, look at your oximeter again. If it's dropping, it means that you're getting into troubled waters. So I think it's very, very easy that we... Take all this complicated um, mumble-jumble stuff off and come to simple things that patients can understand. The spirometry is some sort of huge gimmick that people look at. No, it's some jargon that they don't understand. 
And I think we need to break this down to them and tell them that this is what it is. In the six-minute walk, I think, is a wonderful estimate of not only the lung function, but also the whole cardiovascular function itself. And what more do you need than that? I think that's a wonderful test that we should be doing. We should be teaching patients to do. And of course, you need to make them exercise. You need to make them walk. And I think that's important. The diabetics will say 30 minutes walking. 1,200 calories per day plus 30 minutes walking. The pulmonologist hardly says that. But I think we should say that you need, that you need to walk for 30 minutes. You need to keep your weight down. You need to keep your exercise going. 30 minutes exercise. That's what it is. So I think it is important that we understand and balance these two things. So the twain has to meet somewhere. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, so. I, I really appreciate sir, the way you have brought up. Those are very, very important points you have said. Absolutely. And Act. the six-minute walk test has been a very important tool, especially in our post-COVID assessment yeah. of patients where, I mean, it's very simple and the patients feel very assured when they are, know they're able to walk and they realize that their saturation is not falling and mm -hmm. they're able to manage with like minimum people who have got severe lung uh, uh, damage and all, we are able to manage and it's amazing. We don't need any big contraption for yeah. that and easily doable and all. And, but the one thing which we have, uh, yeah, before yeah, please, you please. Go yes, ahead. yes, yeah, yeah. I just want to add one or two small things what Sarah said, in that uh, the differentiating point between COPD and asthma, because I know many of you will be feeling about whether I really have asthma, asthma or COPD, COPD or mm. your near and dear one. The two more points are: one is if uh, there is a variation, large variations, day-to-day -day variations, or or different. Uh, season-wise variations <coughs> like say winters and rainy seasons if they are having more changes they are possibly asthma and also <coughs> if uh, those are smoking related uh, breathing difficulty kind of thing then they are mostly COPDs um, uh, and one more thing about the PFT what Sir has said the PFT is an extremely important test so MGM hospital has uh, decided on the occasion of this uh, World Health Day they will be doing the spirometry test for free for one week for patients who really need it. So it's a call. Excellent. Can, uh, there take, we go. Take care of it. Yes. So m my burden at the preventive health checks has increased now. <laughs> yes. It's okay. We we are here to deliver the <laughs> the, the deed. Yes. Absolutely. Now the, the one more thing which I really now that that top topic has come up is this. We have people who come up uh, and say that. I am, and this is basically comparison between Chennai and Bangalore. The Chennai is a humid uh, city and Bangalore is a dry city. Say for example me, when I go to Bangalore I start wheezing. I know there is Parthenium there but when I come back to Chennai I am fine. But there is rivers also. People who are fine there are, they feel difficulty in breathing or wheezy here sir. I mean what is that variation which is I mean any, any, any light on that? Any of you, I mean, the usually in, in a Bangalore climate, uh, there are a lot of garden. This usually we call it as a garden city, a lot of flowers. Mm. Pollen is the main culprit right. in uh, Bangalore right. city. In Chennai, pollen is not there. Majority is a dusty area mm. because, like Delhi, Kolkata, here a lot of dust. So, dust induced problem. Not but the there are. Sir. Yeah, community is less role only because of the dust, it will aggravate the asthma attack and COPD exacerbation, lot of problem because of the dusty, dust is the main culprit in Chennai. In Bangalore, pollen is one of the main culprit, uh, no, aggravating factor. So apart from this, um, I don't know about the I don't know, sir. I cross Basur and I start <laughs> So I think you should go through Chittur. <laughs> <laughs> no, the point is really, that we need to understand that once you're diagnosed with asthma, you don't stop your medication. What you do is that you bring down your medication and that is the key. Maybe if you're in Chennai and if you think you, your asthma is kicking through the roof, then you can increase the dose when you come to Chennai. When you go back to Bangalore, maybe you can do with one simple puff in the night and be done and be absolutely certain that nothing is going to nothing is going to displace you off and I think that's what I would encourage people to do you knock your doses down but you don't stop just like the diabetic who doesn't take absolutely. that metformin off absolutely. Absolutely. it's impossible for a diabet for a diabetologist to write off the metformin he will never do that 
So I think that should be the practice that we have, that we hold these doses and hold them at one dose in the night in, in situations where you feel comfortable and in situations where you don't feel comfortable, you push the dose up. Absolutely. As far as the lungs are concerned, there is one thing about the treatment which is very important. One is that there is something called as induction phase and where you intensify the treatment and we treat maintenance and the maintenance is as much the patient's responsibility as much the physician's clarity of giving the instruction and you need to go back to your doctors, your pulmonologist, talk to them if you are not comfortable. There are amazing delivery systems now, the devices are becoming simpler and simpler, such beautiful, you just have to put it in your pocket, they are as small as your pen and your lipsticks ladies, so you know it's like so beautiful, you can just carry it around and there is no stigma associated, when, if there is no stigma associated with smoking, I don't think there should be a stigma associated with inhalers also. So quickly we have time for two very very important topic and I'm going to start with Roy here. Roy. Uh, uh, before that, just, yes. ju just uh, one more thing on this. The m one very important part, what uh, maybe over the time uh, patients of asthma and COPD will slowly forget or over time they will do the wrong way of mm. taking the inhalations. Oh, there's that, a beautiful that, that, WhatsApp uh, video about that. Yes. It's, an, it's a good joke. I, I just want to remind you people <laughs> again, ki the procedure is yes. extremely, extremely Absolutely. important. If you have any doubt, even if you are sure that you are doing it correctly, please bring your machine, whatever <laughs> device you are using and the drug and meet your pulmonologist and talk to him or her whether your procedure of using that device is correct or not. This is extremely important, Very important. to control your drug Absolutely. and disease. So please do that so and take your drugs regularly as, as Sarah has just now said. Yes. Please continue it even if you do not have any problem. Yes, yes ma'am, go ahead. This is called a standardization of technique. Like the gold standards for the asthmatic and the chronic um, obstructive lung disorders are the pulmonologist. So you need to bring back your inhalers, your spacers, the different MDI devices and check with your pulmonologist whether you are using it the right way. Otherwise, you will end up using it, not getting the full benefit and the, there will be medicine wastage and uh, a lot of patients just drop their spacers and continue to use only inhalers and it's just a fancy piece in the bag. So let's do it the right way. Yeah. Then moving on to the next topic is interstitial lung disease and we know it is like a bottomless pit. Mm -hmm. When we start ILD, I think the latest addition to ILD has been COVID. <laughs> so where do we start with Roy? I mean, where is, where is the beginning of ILDs? Well, uh, this is one of the disease which uh, we do not have much to offer basically to at the end of it. Yes, we have much to offer for diagnosing the patient. Most of them are acquired disease. Very few are maybe from congenital or childhood disease, but most of them acquired. One of the important thing again comes boil down to the smoking. So smoking not only causes COPD and uh, cardiac diseases, but ILD, ILD. Uh, one of the major ILD is uh, the reason is behind that is uh, smoking. So cut down on smoking again. So now ILD is basically for there are a huge number of divisions. So there will be at least 24 to 25 types of ILDs are there. Out of that the major ones are number one is uh, IPF or uh, idiopathic pulmonary, pulmonary fibrosis which causes basically unknown. That's why it is idiopathic. But it can be associated with smoking and in maybe sometimes in childhood cases. Uh, so as uh, how do we go about that IPF and then the other thing is uh, somewhat related to connective tissue disorders. So these are the two main kind of, uh, of you can say ILDs, there are many others. So how to go about them is diagnose them early, that's the most important thing. Diagnose them early means if you are having some persistent cough or progressive, very slow progressive weak uh, breathing difficulty, uh, then please contact your uh, pulmonologist so that they can take care of your uh, lung health and can diagnose it with a CT scan or with a pulmonary function test and they can come to a 
diagnosis for what is the cause of that slow progressive disease. Uh, not only that, we have to think of that connective tissue disease. If there is any um, background connective tissue disease, then that need to be treated. Yeah. And there are few drugs now currently available to uh, have some kind of an impact. Basically, we do not have extremely fantastic drugs, but some impactable drugs are there. Uh, so, according to the disease condition and uh, according to your pulmonologist, after assessment, they will consider the drug, those drugs. Uh, and at the very last, if nothing else works, then comes the oxygen. And if oxy oxygen is a fantastic drug, I, I must uh, point out here oxygen is, uh, though it is available in the air, but uh, oxygen inhalation if needed. Uh, I have seen that many patients of ILDs are, are reluctant to use oxygen. Uh, they think it will become a habit, habit. but it is not so. The oxygen is a life saving drug. It is the need. And yeah. not only that, it <coughs> reduces the uh, ongoing pulmonary hypertension, which can cause a sudden death in all those uh, ILD patients. So very important drugs, so please continue, forget about uh, addiction or habit forming about oxygen. We take oxygen with each breath. We do not have in a habit. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is, yeah, we cannot live without oxygen. Yeah. So, for, so just let me uh, put it across what Dr. Somitra Roy is telling is that ILD is a disease which affects the, uh, the cementing place of the lung. The lung is kept together by certain uh, important tissues and the interstitial lung disease affects that part. So, it affects with the oxygenation uh, of the, even if the person is able to breathe, the airway is, the passage is good, the lung tissue is good, but because there is a problem in between the lung tissue, the uh, lung becomes stiffer. Now, once you have diagnosed, once you have uh, a, uh, under treatment, what you need to continue is the oxygen and like Dr. Roy is saying that oxygen is the pranavayu, right? But I think now the ultimate thing with interstitial lung disease after you have become totally uh, dependent on like you need oxygen uh, requirement is increasing. I am not going to say dependent. The oxygen requirement keeps on increasing. I think the only answer left is the lung transplant yeah. and lung is one organ where you cannot do only one lung transplant. It is both the lung transplant. So yeah. uh, here again, uh, the issue is when you should think of transplant in a case of an ILD. Uh, we have seen in India, um, the patients are coming at almost at the very last fag end <coughs> of their life when when the, there is basically nothing can be done. So, the point is uh, lung transplant in a ILD is, is should be done in a window when the patient is not very, uh, their uh, general health is not so down that they cannot take this. It is a huge uh, surgery. It is about 8 hours of surgery and the post surgery, the recuperation period is about 2 to 3 weeks. So, this whole uh, big impact on the health has to be has to be um, uh, it sometimes can overwhelm the patient and death can happen. So, it should be uh, in a big window when uh, we have not done the surgery too early also and we have not done the surgery too late also. So, that is an important point. So, uh, I would suggest any person who is on oxygen or who is uh, needing a hospital uh, admission more than three times in a year or more than once with uh, ICU admission in last one year. This kind of patient who are it seriously ill, they should start meeting their pulmonologist and inquire about whether anything further can be done to his lungs uh, and maybe uh, lung transplant surgery for them. Yeah. At this point, I would like to tell that at MGM, we have done close to 91 transplants out of which 18 are post covid lung transplant total of 59 post covid and non covid and if you take the heart and lung another 26 so we have like around 90 we, we really really at one of the top most uh, 
uh, institutes in Asia who are doing lung transplant, you have any doubt or any awareness, any questions about it, please reach out to our pulmonologist. We are always here to answer those questions. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, yes, that, that is, I mean, the, the, when we talk about spectrum of diseases, we look at what, is, what are the diseases, do we have the treatment, and is it treatable, do we have the treatment, is it reachable to common person, a common layman, a person, is it accessible, and the answer is yes to all the three questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, yeah. Dr. Roy. Yes. So the, 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 the next faction of the lung disorder is malignancy. And there is like a huge boomerang. We say tobacco, tobacco, tobacco. But I think there has been a huge emergence of people with lung cancers who are non-smoker also, Dr. Jairaman sir. What do we say about that? Lung cancer is one of the common lung disease. Lung cancer, if we take the among the cancers, this is the number one uh, cancer among the morbidity and mortality. Mainly because of the uh, tobacco smoke and the external pollution, mainly the ionizing radiations and the exposure to asbestos, the lot of occupational uh, things which leads to uh, lung cancer, mainly the air pollution, because of the environmental pollutions and secondhand smoke and uh, smoking, tobacco smoke, which all leads to uh, lung cancer. In a uh, world scenario, lung cancer is the number one cancer. In India and in the world scenario, if you take the diagnosis, initially it's very difficult. In the sense, uh, if you take in India, we have a tuberculosis is a very, very uh, common, is an endemic country. Tuberculosis in India is a very endemic. The symptomatology of uh, lung cancer and tuberculosis both are same way. Cough, uh, the blood tinge sputum, and the breathlessness, chest pain, all similar category, weight loss, everything. So, ma majority of the lung cancer patient initially diagnosed, uh, no over as tuberculosis, they started on anti TB therapy. After two, three months, there is no improvement of you know, persistent uh, blood while coughing and weight loss and other uh, cough and all. Then the patient you know, uh, reached the pulmonologist. We do a CT scan and the bronchoscopy to find out this patient has uh, lung cancer, not the tuberculosis. Because of the uh, variety of presentation, most of the patients of lung cancer, one third they present with the direct lung symptoms with the cough and blood while coughing and breathing issues and chest pain and loss of weight, appetite and all. One third of the patient uh, without any symptoms, silently they will be there. Incidental finding, if you go for the preventive checkup, muscle checkup or any visa purpose, you want to take a chest radiography, you can see some opacities in the radiograph, then uh, suggested for any CT scan. The CT scan which shows some uh, speculated mass lesion suggestive of bronchogenic cancer, lung cancer. Then the patient referred to pulmonologist for bronchoscopy. We do bronchoscopy and take a biopsy, then clinch a diagnosis. So the early diagnosis is very, very important. And another one third of the patient, they present with a metastatic advanced symptom. Patients having lung cancer, they have the seizure defects, seizure disorder. If you take the CT scan, there is a finding in the brain, which is the secondary, primary in the lung. And some patients will have jaundice, present with the jaundice. They have a uh, no, liver lesion, primarily in the lung lesion, spread from the liver, uh, lung to liver. So such a metastatic, uh, such a metastatic lesions we are seeing one third of the patient. So the lung cancer diagnosis is challenging one. India also very challenging because of tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. So in overall, lung cancer is the first can number one cancer among the morbidity and mortality. In India, this is the second leading cause of uh, mortality uh, next to the oral cancer, oral head and neck cancer. In female population, next to CA breast and uh, CA cervix, this is the third uh, leading cause of uh, no, morbidity and mortality lung cancer. So the uh, early diagnosis is very, very important. So any patients with the blood while coughing or cough, so we have to you know, take care at most and do the CT scan. Clinical examination is very, very important. History is very, very important. Any exposure history, smoking history are paramount important. Apart from this, uh, CT scan will clinch and the biopsy is a gold standard. So tissue is the issue in diagnosing these type of malignancy to confirm and we call the tumor board and we'll assess which category of treatment, whether surgery or chemotherapy or radiotherapy. We have a lot of advancement in lung cancer management. We have immunotherapy, we have a targeted therapy. In MG, we have a state-of-the-art department of uh, interventional pulmonology and oncology department. So we have everything is available here. So the lung cancer diagnosis is a high index of suspicious. Any patients with uh, atypical symptoms or any cough more than two, three weeks time, 
no tuberculosis, put them, put them negative for AFB, so we have to suspect malignancy and uh, do the CT scan and bronchoscopy. Through bronchoscopically, we have, uh, no, we can make a complete diagnosis. We have a basic bronchoscopy and we have advanced bronchoscopy like uh, endobronchial ultrasound in MGM. We do all the diagnostic workup under the, no, uh, one number law. We have intervention pulmonology team. We do all the procedures, both the diagnostic and therapeutic for the lung cancer diagnosis and management. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much, sir. But the, uh, the uh, if I can add on. Yeah, sure, sure. I'm going Sorry. to, I was going to ask. Yeah, continue. Yes. Um, e extremely important. Whatever Sarah said is extremely important for this. Uh, again, some data. I like data as always. Yes, the uh, data man. <laughs> the, let's talk about uh, co uh, five year survival of cancer. If you are diagnosing late, that means we have got different stages, stage one, two, three, four. If we are beyond stage two of lung cancer survival, Western countries, 15 percentage, very meager 15 percentage. In India, I am sure it is about five to six percentage if we are diagnosing beyond uh, stage two. So the goal here is early diagnosis. If we can yes. diagnose them early and pick them early, then definitely we can do much help for them. And towards that, the first thing is, is the symptom management. As soon as if you have some symptoms with background smoking, please contact your pulmonologist rather than, uh, rather than thinking about it's nothing, it's my cigarette smoke and nothing else. Yeah, that's one. And then there comes uh, the Department of Intervention and Pulmonology, where we can do early diagnosis bronchoscopy yes bronchoscopy is very important but nowadays we are trying to do the early diagnosis by doing the ebus ebus has brought ebus is endobronchial ultrasound ebus has brought a sea change over how we really diagnose previously if you remember sir uh, dr pkt sir uh, we used to think of keep less than a centimeter size of uh, lymph node in mediastinum previously we thought it is nothing need to be done we will observe Hmm. Nowadays, we are going in and taking a sample, sample. from that lymph node below subcentimeter size very frequently. Not only that, we are going across the pulmonary arteries and even aorta and take a sample and come out and so that we can diagnose early. That's the main goal. And we can start therapy early. So if that kind of a problem is there, please uh, think of come over to hospital. Absolutely. And... Uh there is more to the lung than what we can actually see. We have a huge uh, uh, umbrella of obstructive sleep apnea, which we are not even touching right now, you know, I mean, and that is again uh, something which we really need to bring out and uh, discuss is that snoring is not normal. It's just the beginning of your sleep problems. And we at uh, MGM have a very robust team who takes care of sleep study in a very beautiful way and we diagnose it and amazing therapeutic uh, um, systems in place with uh, the latest uh, uh, say, uh, the CPAP machines and all and uh, we are here to guide you please reach out and uh, 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 take help the other is that there are a lot of unknown diseases which are hidden in the lung. So on the World uh, Lung Day, we are launching some specialized clinic. So sir, uh, can you give us a pointer about the... I think one of the things which is the real need of the R is to continue something that we've always been saying but not doing and that is smoking cessation. So a smoking cessation clinic has been envisaged for donkey's years and it's not really been put into implementation. I think we have structured a framework where we can try to do something. Uh, we haven't been try we haven't been very elaborate about we tried to keep it very simple so that people understand what they're doing. So I think this is a facility that people should use, number one. Number two is that we are also looking at a targeted asthma clinic where you have targeted therapy like the biologics for example. You have targeted therapy towards a certain specific type of asthma that you have because today we are now looking at various types of asthma, looking at neutrophilic asthma, looking at posigranulocytic asthma, looking at older onset asthma and all those things. So I think all these things will, will definitely be taken care of because there are certain biologics that target this. Biologics are a group of small molecules. 
uh, small molecular weight molecules which are basically part of the biologic system and they will tackle the the cause of that really. So I think it's important that we understand that biologics are the future of um, asthma treatment. So it is important to do that. So these are two things that we really like to do. And I think it's very, very important that we use it to the maximal benefit that we possibly can. In MGM Healthcare, in our pulmonology department, we have the state of the art uh, sleep medicine clinic. In sleep medicine, we have a specialist sleep clinic department. So we do a diagnostic and therapeutic workup for the sleep disorders. Mainly you know well the respiratory perspective of sleep disorders is the sleep apnea. That means obstructive sleep apnea. There is a snoring is a very important symptom. Majority of them if you ask the layman snoring in sleep means they thought yeah very good sleep yeah snoring uh, they thought. So they really as a medical practitioner we know that any snoring is the struggling to breathe. This is one of the indications of the respiratory block upper airway block. So snoring is a very important symptom of the respiratory uh, that is sleep apnea obstructive sleep apnea. We have the sleep uh, no, uh, testing facilities here which uh, we have in lab uh, polysomnography and bedside uh, level 3 polysomnography that is sleep test and we have the facility of the portable monitoring system for the sleep uh, lab and sleep study to diagnose the sleep disorders mainly as a respiratory doctor we diagnose the obstructive sleep apnea and we do after the once diagnose the problem we evaluate the patient whether he is benefit from the CPAP CPAP is a gold standard you know well CPAP is the continuous positive airway pressure this is the treatment modality for the obstructive sleep apnea those who are now to able to wear the CPAP we see the patient at the curative intent for that we have a multidisciplinary team we have a surgical team mainly the ENT and head and neck surgeon and we have the specialty team is here to take, take care of all the sleep disorder issue so we have state of the art department in sleep medicine thank you to continue in that same vein uh, we have got uh, another new clinic launching that is called uh, lung failure clinic that's meaning is if you have some kind of a end stage lung disease from any causes like it can be COPD it can be interstitial lung disease or anything else and <coughs> you are now basically dependent on oxygen so you can come over talk to us and uh, we can try to find out what best we can do after this whether any further drugs will be helpful or maybe we can start talking on lung transplant kind of an scenario if needed so that's the lung failure clinic and uh, the other thing what we are doing uh, it's not a new thing what we are doing but uh, i just want to highlight that is the interventional pulmonology services which uh, we have in our hospital with a different state-of-the-art bronchoscopes pediatric bronchoscopes and uh, e-bus bronchoscope which as, as I said has uh, changed the face of diagnosis early diagnosis towards cancer and so many other things so consider having uh, talking to us if you have any problem related to newer cough or breathing difficulty. That's thank it. you very much thank you very much P.K. Somas sir, thank Dr. Jairam and Dr. Somas it was a pleasure uh, listening to you people talk about pulmonology. I think the world of pulmonology, like I, like I said, has got so much more than we actually see or we breathe, I think. So with that, uh, we come to the end of this session. And uh, okay, the last but not the least, I think we are also going uh, ahead with a fellowship program in transplant. And uh, the details will be available on our website pretty soon. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank Good you. Day. Thank you. Thanks. Nice.